Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. This is the next tutorial on the coding a 2D game engine in Java series. In the last tutorial what we did was we went over how to program a GPU, the high level abstract concepts. In this tutorial we're going to be employing all those techniques so it's really important that you see that before you do this one if you've never done any graphics programming before. So what we're going to be doing is drawing a square to the screen that has a nice gradient going uh, from each of the corners. So we're going to be drawing this using vertex colors, which means we can assign a color to each of the vertices. And then we're just going to be drawing it to the screen. So it's going to be a little bit hard. There's going to be a lot of new stuff. But if you've seen the last tutorial, hopefully it'll have prepared you sort of for what is about to come. And you'll be able to understand it as we're going through it. Okay, guys, so let's do that real quick. Alright guys, so we're going to start coding now and we're going to do quite a few things to get this square up onto the screen. So first thing I'm going to do is remove this sort of temporary code we had in the level editor scene. just going to delete all this. It was sort of just a proof of concept to make sure we knew what we were doing and how we could use all the different things that we were starting to use. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is create an init method because we're going to need that eventually. So let's go into our scene. And we're going to create a public void in it that the scene can uh, override if they would like to. And then inside window, like I said before, we are actually going to initialize now. So I'm going to uncomment this and then copy it down to here so that all scenes are initialized before they are run. So we can see when we change a scene, we create the scene which calls the constructor, then it initializes, and then it calls run on the scene as the very last step. Next thing we're gonna do is go back into our level editor scene and we will be doing some stuff in here in just a moment. But before we can, one of the main things you need in order to do, to draw things to the screen using the GPU is shaders. Shaders sort of describe the way that it needs to be drawn to the screen. So we're gonna build a super simple shader that will literally just put what we give it to the GPU and display it on the screen. So I'm gonna go, I'm right clicking up here at the project root and I'm gonna hit a new directory and I'm gonna call this assets. And then inside this assets folder, I'm gonna do another new directory and call this shaders because shaders are assets in my mind in this because they're a file that we have to load. So then I'm gonna do a new file and call this default.glsl, which is GL's shader language. So that's what it stands for, graphics library shader language. I'm gonna add this to Git. Uh, if you were doing version control, I would recommend doing that too. Now I have a syntax highlighter for my shaders. And if you wanna do that, Hit Control Alt Shift S, and actually that's the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> go to File and then go into Settings, and you'll see this thing called Plugins. The plugin I have for this shader is called GLSL Support, and it just highlights my shaders for me. You can install it just by going to Plugins and then searching here, and it'll pull it up for you. The this I'm not going to explain too much about. These are very simple and we're going to go into more depth about shader language and everything once we actually talk specifically about shaders. But since this is just a means to the end for this video, we're just going to sort of go through it. So um, this is just decoration for us later on in the series. It doesn't actually, this isn't actually a part of the language feature. So this is actually nothing to do with shaders. But I'm going to say hashtag type vertex version 330 core, which is my GL version that I'm using. And then we're going to do layout location equals zero in vec3, and I'm going to call this a pose. I prefix my variables in shaders with letters so that I know what they stand for. A is an attribute, so I know that anything starting with an A is an attribute, which we also know because it's coming from this layout location. Next, we're going to say layout location equals one, and this is going to be in a vec4, and this is going to be our A color. So this is sort of the attributes we're going to define. We're going to define a position and a color that we will send to the shader. Next thing we're going to do is have a variable that we're going to pass to the fragment shader. And we're going to say out vec4 f color. And so I prefix it with an f for fragment because this is going to the fragment shader. Then uh, all shaders have a main function. So we can just call that right here. We'll say void main. And we're going to say f color equals a color. We're just going to pass the color to the fragment shader. And then we're going to say gl position, which is just a variable that is always there and that we need to define, is a vec4 a pose 1.0. And what that means, it's going to create a vector 4 using this as the first three uh, parts of that vector and one as the last part of that vector. Now I'm going to say hash type fragment. Once again, this is just decoration so that we know 
and then we're going to say hashtag version 330 core. Same way we started the vertex shader. Uh, this is now our fragment shader, everything from this line down. And we're going to say it takes in a vec4 f color. And this is important. If you forget this, it's going to say there is an error because we have an out vec4 color here. We need an in here to the fragment. Now we're going to say out vec4 color. This is sort of our user defined variable that says, hey, GL, this is the color we are outputting. And we'll say main void main because all fragment shaders have a main function too. We're just going to say color equals f color. So literally all this is doing is we're giving GL the position that we passed in and then we're passing the color from the vertex to the fragment shader and it's just coloring the square of that color. So nothing too complicated in the shader. Once again, I, like I said, we'll go more into depth about how shader language works and more stuff you can do with it. But this is all we need for now. So now that we have our shader source, let's go into our level editor scene and we're going to create two variables up here. Uh, actually, let's just make these private. So I we'll have a private string vertex shader source, and this is going to equal some string. And then we're going to have a private string fragment shader source, and this is also going to equal some string. And then if we go back into our shader, copy everything for the vertex shader, everything from the version 3.3 core down to the bottom of the main function. And then if you just go back into your level editor scene and copy and paste it here, GL, or I mean IntelliJ formats it for us, which is really nice. Puts in all the pluses and the slash ends, super cool. Go back into default, GLSL, and then copy this, the fragment shader, and then we'll go back into level letter scene and paste that right there. So now we have our fragment and our vertex source strings, and we're gonna need a couple more things so that GL can identify them. So since we're passing data from the CPU to the GPU, we need sort of uh, identifiers so that we can know what we're working with when we're talking to the GPU. So GL gives us these things called IDs for identifiers so that we can identify what we're working with. So we have identifiers for the vertex, the fragment, and the shader program, which is the combination of the vertex and the fragment source. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna actually set these. So we'll go into here and we will override that init function that we just created. So we'll make a new initialization. And inside this initialization, what we're going to do is first we're going to compile and link the shaders. And this is actually pretty straightforward, but if you don't know the functions, you have no idea what's going to happen. So first thing we're going to do is load and compile the vertex shader. And we do that by saying vertex ID, the identifier we want is GL create shader and we're going to pass it the GL vertex shader to tell GL this is a vertex shader. Hit Alt 4 over this and then just hit import static constant and just make sure you do the GL 2.0 without a C or 3.0, whichever one you have, it's fine. And then I'm going to import that one as well. Next, we want to pass the shader source code to the GPU so that it can compile it and everything. So we will say GL shader. This is actually probably not passing it to the GPU. Uh, we are probably, GL is doing something under the hood that's just sort of making sure everything gets done properly. So we are gonna send it the vertex ID. This is the shader we want to pass the source for and we're gonna pass it the shader source. So we're saying pass in the shader source to that ID which is the shader we just created uh, up there. So right here, and I'm gonna do that and hit Alt-4 and import that. I did that wrong, there we go. Then we're gonna say GL compile shader. Vertex ID, the identifier we want to compile, and that's pretty simple. Now we want to check and see if there were errors because if there was an error, we're not gonna know about it unless we look for it. So we're gonna say check for errors in the compilation process. And we're going to say int success equals gl get shader i, which stands for info. So get shader info for our vertex ID. And we want the compile status. So we're going to say gl compile status, which will give us a zero if it did not succeed and a one or something else, something non-zero if it did succeed. And so we'll say if success equals gl false which is just a zero. If you control over this, you can see it says GL false is just zero. So if we did not succeed, first we have to get the length of this string. And this is because of some of the things, right? Like I said, we're going into C a little bit here. And so C is very verbose when it comes to strings. You need the length 
and in order to just display the string. So let's say get shader I for get shader info. And we're going to pass in the vertex ID. And we're going to ask for the GL info log length, which will give us the length of the info log. Then we'll say system.out.println error default shader dot glsl is the file that we had the error in and we're going to do new line and tab and say vertex shader compilation failed just to give ourselves you know what is happening here then we're going to say system dot out dot print line and we're going to say gl get shader info log which will get us that info log and we're going to pass in the vertex id and the length because it needs both of those in order to do it and I'm just going to say assert false and an empty string. And what this is going to do is it's just going to break out of the program. But I think you do need to enable assertions in order for that to work. And I can't exactly remember where that is. I will mention that in the next tutorial, how to enable assertions. But it will work once you have it enabled. So next thing we need to do is load the fragment shader and compile. Literally the same exact thing as this, except for fragment shader. So I'm going to copy all that, paste it right here. We're going to call this fragment ID, copy fragment ID, and paste it everywhere you see vertex ID. And we no longer want to declare this as a new variable since it's not. And then we want to go up to where we create the shader and just make sure we tell it it's a fragment shader, not a vertex shader. And make sure you pass in the fragment shader source instead of the vertex shader source. And that should be good. So now we have compiled and checked for errors for the fragment shader too. Now we want to create the actual program, link it, and that should be the rest of it for our shader work. So we're gonna say link shaders and check for errors. Very similar to what we just did up there too. We're gonna say shader program equals GL create program. So once again, we're creating a new unique identifier for our program. And we're gonna say attach shader, GL attach shader, shader program. We want to attach the vertex ID to our shader program. And we want to attach the fragment ID to our program. And then we'll say link the program and we'll just pass it the program. So now we've attached both shaders and we're saying, okay, now link it together. And next we have to check for linking errors. So we'll say success equals GL get program I. So get program info, shader program and GL link status. So we're looking for the link status, not compile status now. And once again, if success equals GL false, then we had an error and we'll say int length equals gl get program i and we're going to say shader program instead this time and gl info log length once again then we'll just say uh, copy all this stuff real quick and paste right here and also change this from vertex to fragment because this is when we were compiling the fragment so we do want to make sure we're accurate when we're displaying the errors and then we'll say right here, instead of vertex shader comp compilation failed, we'll say linking of shaders failed. And then we will get the shader, the program info log. So not the shader info log. So say get program info log, and we'll pass in the shader program and the length, and that should be good. And then assert false and just break out of there. So all of this will compile and link the two shaders that we defined up here, which is good. If you run it, you should get no errors. And if we look down here, you see there were no errors. And then say for instance, you misnamed this. You said in is a VEC4 color. And then we can run this one more time. Uh, it says error default shader. If you click up here, it shows you the full error. And then we'll notice it says error default shader.gsl fragment shader compilation failed undefined variable F color. And you see it was expecting that F color variable because we passed it out of the vertex shader. So you can just change that back, but that shows that our error checking is working and it will notify us if they are. And you can also tell that assertions are not working because it didn't break out of our program, which we will fix in a little bit. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create our vertex array, our element array, and our vertex attribute object, which is those other things I talked about in that last tutorial. So first we're gonna go up here and we are gonna say private float vertex array equals and we're going to create a vertex array right there and then we're also going to have private int element array equals and we're going to do this right here and so for our vertex array the way i want it to be is i want our vertices first or our positions i'm going to change that <laughs> and then our color second so 
This should be position and then color is the way we want to format it. So uh, we have to pass these in in normalized device coordinates. Remember, negative one is the left side of the screen, positive one is the right side of the screen. So if we want a square, what we're going to do is we're going to say 0.5f um, minus 0.5f, 0.0f. We have to pass in as x, y, z. And this is going to be the bottom left, bottom right, sorry. And then for the color for the bottom right, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do 1.0f, so red, and then 1.0f. And then let's just leave a comment to ourselves. This is the bottom right. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to do minus 0.5f, 0.5f, 0.0f. And this is going to be the top left. And I'm just going to do this one as green, right? So RG, and then this one is B for blue. And this will be our alpha eventually. It's actually not going to work right now. So this is going to be our top left. The next vertex we're going to do is 0.5f, 0.5f, 0.0f. And we're going to call this one just the last color we have, which is blue. And so we're going to say this is the top right. And then lastly, we have to get the bottom left vertex for our square. So we're going to say minus 0.5f, minus 0.5f, 0.0f. And I'm just going to make this one uh, that's red and green. So I think that will give us a yellow. And we'll say this is the bottom left. This is important that we know what we're doing here too, because we do want to be able to tell if uh, we are actually getting the right colors that we're expecting, which we'll check in a second. I'm just going to format these so that they're all lined up the same. Okay, so that's our vertices, our vertex array. Uh, this, as you can see, we have position, color, position, color, position, color. That's the format that we are going to be expecting. Now for our element array, which basically says we want two triangles, the top right of the square and the bottom left of the square, and we need to define how these go. And it is important that you know this must be in counterclockwise order. So if we have a square, that's the top left corner, or yep, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are going in counterclockwise order. So when we specify we have a triangle here with these three vertices, we must go this vertice, then this vertice, then this vertex. And then when we go here, we must go this vertex, this vertex, this vertex for the bottom left triangle, for the top right triangle. And to specify those, we can just look up here. We know which, so bottom right is zero, top left is one, top right is two, bottom left is three. And then we can just use those indices to specify the order we want them to go in. So I'm going to say two, one, zero for the top right triangle. And then I'm going to say zero, one, three for the bottom left triangle. And if you do the indices in order of which ones these are, so this is zero, this is one, this is two, and this is three, you'll notice that it goes just in the format that I specified where we have the top right triangles vertices specified here and the bottom left triangles specified here. So that's our element array. Now we have everything we need to send them to the GPU. We have all the data, now we just want to actually send it to the GPU. So we'll go back down to our initialization function, and this is where we're going to be generating our VAO, our VBO, and our EBO buffer objects and sending them to the GPU. So uh, we're going to need a couple more IDs, actually. Uh, let's go up here, and we're just going to say private int VAO ID, VBO ID, and EBO ID for vertex vertex array object, vertex buffer object, element buffer object. So go back down here. We'll say VOID equals glgen vertex arrays. And this is sort of OpenGL's way of creating a new vertex array inside the GPU and giving us that unique identifier once again. So we'll import that by hitting Alt 4. Then we'll say GL bind vertex array VAO ID. What this does is says, okay, everything we're about to do, make sure we're doing it uh, to this array specifically. So make sure that everything that comes after this line is happening to this vertex array. So next we're gonna say create a float buffer of vertices. We have to send a float buffer to OpenGL because that's just what it's expecting. So we'll say float buffer, vertex buffer equals buffer utils dot create float buffer and we're just gonna pass in our vertex array 
dot length is what we want to do. So we're saying create a float buffer of the length vertex array length because that's how many we want to put into it. Then we'll say vertex buffer dot put and we want to put our vertex array in there and make sure you do dot flip because this will just make sure it's oriented the correct way for OpenGL. If you don't do that, it will throw an error and completely mess up. Okay, next we want to actually create the VBO and we want to upload the vertex buffer. So vertex buffer. So what we'll do is we'll say VBO ID equals GL gen buffers. So once again, we're just generating a new buffer. GL bind buffer. So we want to say, make sure everything we're doing is for this buffer specifically. And then we need to say GL array buffer because this is just an array and VBO ID. That's the VBO, that's the ID we want to bind. So we're working on a certain VAO right now. We're working on a certain object, which is why we bound a vertex array. And right now we're saying, okay, now we're working on a certain buffer. Make sure you have this buffer in mind. Then we're just going to say GL buffer data. And we're going to say GL array buffer, vertex buffer, and GL static draw, which all this is, is we're saying, okay, we're working with an array buffer. This is the specific buffer that we want you to send to this ID. And we're only going to be drawing it statically. We're never going to be changing anything inside this buffer. So just make sure you use GL static draw. Uh, there is dynamic draw if you are going to be changing things, which we will use in the future. Next, we want to create the indices and upload. So the indices buffer index buffer. So we'll say int buffer element buffer equals buffer utils dot create bu int buffer. Sorry. And we'll just say this is the element array dot length. Then we will say the element buffer dot put the element array and we'll say dot flip. So literally the same thing we did for this one, except for elements. And then we're going to do something very similar to this too, except for elements. So we'll say EBO ID equals GL gen buffers, generating a buffer for the EBO now. Say GL bind buffer, we want to bind the EBO now. This is an element array buffer. It's not just any regular array, it's an element array. So we need to make sure to specify that to GL. We'll say GL buffer data, we want to uh, buffer the element array buffer and we're going to send it the buffer itself and we're going to say gl static draw so once again statically drawing it we're sending it the buffer we just created and we're saying it's an element buffer make sure you know that next we need to add the vertex attribute pointers so this is those things i was telling you about uh, how does the gpu know that we have position first then color well we have to tell it how do we tell it? Well, we're going to find out in just a second. We're going to create pointers that say, okay, position is the first three colors, then four after that. And then the total length of one vertex is seven. We have to specify all that. So this is where we're going to specify all that. We're going to say int positions size. So this is just how many positions there were three X, Y, Z. So position size is three. Int color size equals four. There's four colors, R, G, B, A int float size in bytes is four. So there's four bytes for one float. And if you notice, each of these is a float. We have to make sure to include this. We have to be very specific, very, very. And Java doesn't give us any nice way to know this offhand. You just sort of have to know um, that the size of a float is four bytes. And actually in C, you could do like size of, which will create a sort of implementation, just that we're not saying like, oh, we're just gonna magically know this we're going to actually create something that tells us that. Then we're going to say int vertex size in bytes equals the position size plus the color size times the float size in bytes. So we know that if we add these two, three plus four, and multiply that by how big one float is, it'll give us how big the whole vertex is in floats. It's important. Now we're going to say gl vertex attrib pointer so attribute pointer zero, we're going to say the size is position size three. We're going to say we're passing in GL float. The type is a float. Normalized is false. Uh, technically it's true, but we'll just say false. doesn't matter really what you do for that. Okay. The stride, the stride just means how long till the next vertex. Well, that's seven, but we have to specify that in bytes. So we'll say vertex size in bytes. And then the pointer we're just gonna say zero. That's basically like the offset. So offset is zero because we are not going anywhere to get to that point. 
then say GNL, GL enable vertex atrib array zero. So we just enable it after that. Okay. Now we do the same thing for at, uh, actually, let me real quick show you too. So zero, why, why zero, zero? Well, default.gl cell. Remember, we said location zero, location one. So location zero is the position. And if you notice, we're saying at zero, we're putting the position. And then what we're going to say is GL vertex attrib array, or pointer, sorry, one. And we're going to do the color, right? So the color size, it's also floats false and vertex size has not changed. And now the offset is actually positions size because we've actually moved the position size over. And I think that has to be in bytes as well. It does. So position size times float size in bytes. Uh, make sure you do do this so that it is in bytes and not just the size. So the offset is going to be three because there's three positions times four for the size and bytes before we get to the first color attribute. And that's sort of what we're telling the GPU right there. Okay. And then next we're just going to say GL enable vertex attribute array one same thing we did just a moment ago. Now that we have initialized this and sent our square to the GPU, we can finally draw it, which thankfully you guys are probably thinking is actually pretty simple compared to all the stuff we just did. To do that, first we need to bind our shader program. We're saying, hey, we're using this shader program. So GL use program, and we're gonna give it our shader program, which is our ID. Next, we're gonna bind the vertex, uh, the VAO that we're using, which is the VAO we defined up there. So GL bind vertex array, VAO. Uh, oops, not VAO, VAO ID. So the ID of the VAO we just made, then we're going to enable the vertex attribute pointers. So we'll say GL enable vertex attrib array zero, and then just copy that. Uh, can't remember how to copy in IntelliJ. <laughs> and then one. So we enable zero and one, which are the ones we just defined right here. And then we say GL draw elements. We want to draw them as triangles. So we specify GL draw triangles. Then we say there are six of them, or we could say element array dot length. That's how many uh, indices we have, right? And then we'll say GL unsigned int is the type inside that element array. And we specified it as int, but I don't think Java has an unsigned int specifier. So uh, int is good enough for us. We know they're never going to be negative. And then we're starting at zero. So we just put zero there. Okay. And now that should draw the elements. And then after we draw them, it's important that we unbind everything. So we bound everything right here. Now we say uh, unbind everything, which we do by saying first GL disable vertex attribute array zero and GL disable one. Then we say GL bind vertex at array zero, which basically says zero is sort of a flag that says, okay, just bind nothing. And I'll say GL use program zero to say, okay, use program nothing. And then that just unbinds everything. Now, if we run this, we should get a square. And look at that. It's exactly what we thought it would be. Green, top left, blue, top right, red, bottom right, and yellow, bottom left. If we go back up here, we said that the bottom right would be red, top left would be blue, top right would be green, and bottom left would be yellow. Exactly what we're getting right here. And if we change one of these colors, then if we like say uh, top right should be purple. So I'll do a one right there. Then we will notice the top right is now purple, pinkish. So that's how you draw things <laughs> in OpenGL. Very complicated, I know. Pictures are just as complicated. We have to do a lot more to get a picture up on the screen, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. Uh, one last thing I want you to notice is the gradient. It's not just green up until we get to red. What GL does is if we go to our shader, the color that's getting passed in is actually based on the position within our actual object. And so it'll automatically interpolate and the color will slowly transition to whatever's on the left, the right, the bottom, and the top. There's ways you can change this if you want it to be a hard cutoff in each of the corners. But typically you actually want that gradient because it helps with a lot of things. So. Uh, really cool and you can actually make some cool effects with all that stuff but 
That covers it for this tutorial. It was a long one. It was a lot of new stuff. If anything didn't make sense, please leave a comment and I will try and reply to that and may consider making a follow-up video because this is a lot of stuff and it's a lot of new stuff if you've never seen any of it before and it can get very confusing. I hope it wasn't too confusing because of the previous tutorial, but I don't know. So I know this was super confusing to me when I first saw it, but I hope you guys liked this. If you did, please hit like and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next tutorial in which we will probably start abstracting some of this stuff out so that it makes a little bit more sense. Okay, guys. Thanks. See ya.